Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? Welcome to Change the Narrative, where we have conversations that we do through the mental health lens. This is my co-host, Susie Unger, who is an LMFT, and she's going to introduce our guest today. Thanks, J.D. Um, First, I want to introduce Julie Stern. The article that was published Monday, October 24th, 2020, says it all about her. Quote, a profile in leadership and humanity, humility, and hard work. Julie has risen from intern to PA to running production for major networks, such as OWN, Lifetime, and companies like Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine. And if that isn't impressive enough, Oprah and the Duchess of York named her the General. We are thrilled to have her today as one of our guests. And we have Colonel Aquilo. Colonel went from a successful Hollywood actor with roles in Star Trooper to Who's the Boss to executive producing and directing some of our guiltiest pleasures. Shows like Millionaire Matchmaker and Kathy Griffin, Life on the D-List. He's currently executive producer of The Prophet on CNBC and co-executive producing, along with Julie Stern, the first virtual age march in history sponsored by Revitalash. Additionally, Colonel teaches film and is passionate about his role as a mentor to young Hollywood. Welcome, you guys. Truly appreciate you being here. And I have to admit, one of my guilty pleasures was Millionaire Matchmaker. There I said it, <laughs> I said it aloud for everybody to hear. <laughs> I always say that was my, the favorite show I ever produced. Because it doesn't matter who you are, how rich you are, how cool you are. When you're on a date, everyone is awkward. You know, <laughs> exactly. first day, everyone's just awkward. It's <laughs> Completely true. Well, I'm going to ask some basic questions for those of us who aren't in the business and don't know enough about it. Um, you can help us figure it out together. So the first question is, what is a Hollywood producer? What do you do? Um, a Hollywood producer um, is several different things. Um, it's different if you're talking about film, producing in film and, or motion pictures. Um, it's different if you're talking about television. It's different if you're talking about live events. Um, sometimes the producer role you'll hear about is the person that has to raise the money. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes on feature films, that is the case. Um, a lot of time in television, the show is procured um, and bought by a network. and um, that's where the funding comes from. And if they like the idea, they'll hire the production company to produce it, they'll fund them the money based on a budget, and they'll go produce the show. Um, so I'm often asked that question, and it's, it's just difficult to answer unless somebody has a more, a more specific question to ask. Wouldn't you agree, Colonel? It's, Absolutely. Uh, I tell everyone, you know, because I get asked that even by my, you know, my mom asks me that like once a week, like, what, what do you do? And, uh, and I'm like, I just, I tell everyone, if you throw a rock at a TV set, you're going to hit a producer. And, and they all do different things. Like they, there's, there's, a, a, I primarily work in TV. So they, I mean, as a, as a showrunner, you know, you're, you're responsible to kind of oversee the entire project from kind of ideation to successful completion and delivery. But then within that, there's, there's like this hierarchy of, of, of a team of producers that, that, that helm their different departments. 
and then and it trickles down to where you have your crews and you have all your stuff. So, and these producers are some of them are straight up creative, literally, you know, scripting things out. I mean, producers in TV are writers, you know, and and uh, all the way to you have like the the people who are producers who handle all the money, like Julie was saying, and do that. So there, it's just it, once again just building up what you said, Julie, it's, it is, you have to get more specific. What kind of producer are we talking about? Because it's, it, there are so many. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a, a follow-up question. Yeah. What's the, what is the, how does the executive producer position land in that whole sea of producers you just described? Um, so the, the, once again, there are kind of different kinds of executive producers also. I'm an executive producer generally, uh, but I'm a showrunner. So, so I'm very hands-on with the production part of it. Now, there are also executive producers who kind of develop the project or create the project or finance the project, and they're less hands-on with it. They're more kind of, they bring on a showrunner who, who kind of helms it through. But the, and then those executive producers are, I mean, they can be in various degrees of even kind of uh, c contribution to the project to where you never even hear from them. Uh, some, some, but so uh, I, I hope that answers your question. There yeah, are... yeah, that's great. No, it's really helpful, believe it or not. And then Julie, any, anything to add to that? No, I would, I would just say that when it comes to an executive producer, mm -hmm. um, let's say I'm a buyer and I, you know, I, I do have a lot of network experience. So an executive producer would tie himself to talent, let's say a star or a house, you know, somebody that he wants to pitch a show with. And he'll come in and he's an executive producer and he'll hire an executive producer sh or sh a show runner, as Colonel was saying. And that person runs interference with the network. They're dealing day to day with, um, um, with issues. They're, they're the liaison between the third party company, let's say, who's producing it and the network. It's a very admirable job because they wear so many hats and for the network, it's got to be seamless to us. And we want to see a product that we also, it's important uh, to keep the door open and keep that conversation going so the producer feels that they have an ear. Um, so you do wear a lot of hats. One day you're maybe trying to find money or you're over budget or your talent calls in sick um, or you need to let somebody go or it's, it's just, there's so many elements to it. So when you think about how you became a producer, was it something you aspired to be from the beginning? How did it happen? And both of you. So Julie, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, um, as I mentioned in the Forbes article, it's been in my blood forever. Mm -hmm. and, um, and my dad was in the business behind the camera. So I was always privy to seeing how things were made, how did they do the lighting, how did they, I mean, just everything. And he would bring home movie projectors and, you know, he, he, they used his cameras on many, many high profile films. And so I just learned a lot on the technical side yeah. and the rest is history. I want to be a producer. I want to be a director, um, but I, I knew I needed to produce. So I understood the financial side of it. Okay. So, you know, I'm directing now and producing and executive producing, and it's great. That's great. Colonel, how'd you find your way? I, when I, I started off as an actor out of high school. And, um, and so uh, I, I've been in the industry since I was 18 years old professionally. And then after, but after like 10 years of doing the slog of the acting thing, I then went to, I went back to school, went to film school. And it was there, it, and it just made sense to me. All the language, because I'd learned even, you know, without knowing it, I'd learned the language of television and film by, by being an actor. I'd kind of like just learned it. I was around it. And so being going through film school was, was easy for me in that sense. And then, and I came out wanting to be a director also, um, but I had produced so many little short films in college and, so right out of college, it was the, that's the first jobs I got was producing. And um, I directed some like multi-camera stuff, but then, but really came up through the, the story side and producing 
And, um, and that's how I got to where I'm at right now. Okay, bigger question now. When you think about your journey, what was the scariest, even most traumatic experience you've had in the process of being a producer? I'll give you a second to think about it. What's happened that really just kind of shook you and you tried to, it just kind of made you question everything, if you will. It's hard. I mean, if I, you know, want to jump in while he's still. Yeah, go for it. Um, there are a lot of scary moments. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. When you're responsible for everything, um, you have to, we talked earlier about wearing different hats, mm -hmm. but you really need to finesse the work that you do and who you are when you interact with people. You're, if you're dealing with talent, there's a certain finesse you need, but you need to be honest. You know, you, you test the room out. Um, if it's a crew person or a fellow network executive, you really need to be aware of how you're presenting yourself mm -hmm. um, and always have an ear for people. I, for me, I would say nothing scared me. I had some pretty exciting but traumatic moments. Yeah. Uh, I was there when Michael Jackson's hair caught on fire at the Pepsi commercial. Wow, um, that's pretty. That's pretty traumatic, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't traumatic, but I was just there. Um, so it's one of those things that pops out. But I will be honest. I think when I left Lifetime after so many great years, and um, Own called and asked me to come and oversee production, it was a very big undertaking. Mm -hmm. three months from, from launching the network. And um, it was scary. But I, you know, you had to expand your way of thinking. And right. I felt confident that I had the tools and that I was open to learning more as we went along. Um, mm -hmm. As you can imagine, that was quite daunting. something. An yeah. amazing experience, yeah. Yeah, I would think it would be daunting for real. Uh, Colonel, anything that, that jumps out for you? I guess as I was thinking about it, the, the things that are scary to me is because when you're producing, especially I do a lot of reality TV, when you're producing a lot of reality TV, you're, you're putting, you never know what circumstance you're going to be put in. And you kind of really have to know yourself. And I feel like I've gotten to know myself more by producing the shows because you're put in situations where you have moral dilemmas sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and I can't get, that's why I'm thinking I can't get into the details because of confidentiality and all this, yeah, yeah. but there have been times where I know what's happening is going to harm the, the, the person that is involved. Wow. And, on that, and I look at that and I'm like, this is going to harm that person. And there's a, and I'm, and my job is to get a scene and to get this show. Mm. And, and, and I have to, and so I really had to come to a, um, I really had to figure out like, where is my boundary mm. of when I'm going to push and where I'm going to actually, when, when do I take my stop? And I say, no, I, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do it. And, I, and so that's, there's been scary times for me within that. I can tell you one story. I had a, I had a show it, that I was doing, producing called Sunset Tan years ago. I loved that show, Chris. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous show, Crazy. right? Crazy. So, and it was very, what they call soft scripted, where, it, in fact, it was hard scripted, where it was the, but I didn't know it. I, when I came on, they brought me on and, and I, the show was already running and, and they brought me on to produce uh, some of the episodes. And I didn't know it was fake. I thought it was real. <laughs> and so my first segment, I'm, I'm talking to this mother who's forcing her 10-year-old daughter to get a spray tan. And the 10-year-old daughter's crying. I'm watching this footage. The daughter's crying. And so I get on with the mom. And I'm just tearing into this mom on the phone. And she says to me, she says, well, Colonel, you know it's fake, right? Like, my daughter's an actress, and she, she wants to do this. And I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> I said, but at that moment, that was, one of the, that was one of the first where I was like, am I going to quit this show? Like, am I, am I just going to quit this job? Now, 
that one was a, a happy, easy one. But right. there have been others that have been hard. And like I said, when I have to say scary, that's the thing where you're like, oh my gosh, who am I? Will I, will I let this happen? And my boundary now is like, no, no kids. I, I, I don't do anything that messes with kids at all. Anybody else who volunteers, if you're an adult and you volunteer for a show and you make yourself look stupid, that's on you. But you know, if you're a kid, I don't mess with it. You, you bring something up, which is there's a lot of conversations about what's real and what's not on reality TV. And so it's interesting to hear you say that, yeah, some of it really is completely fake. And, and that's, that's, you know, there's actors who are trying to make a living. So I appreciate that honesty, thank you. Erno, are you saying that reality shows are not real? Uh, so, uh, some of them are, I mean, as, especially back in the early, this wasn't even yeah. early, this was like mid, it was like, it, it's been, it's the Wild West. I mean, in, uh, you know, it, it, it is, the reality TV world is the Wild West. Yeah, that's one side of it, and you're absolutely correct. And we've all been there when it's been semi-scripted or go mm -hmm. flip the table or whatever. But on the other hand, um, there's amazing stories to be told and a lot, um, I would say a fair amount of the reality or docu-series, they're not scripted. You do, the producers and Colonel would have oversight of that, they do need to tell a story. So they do finesse a story, but there are plenty, you know, to show the opposite, there are plenty of shows that actually do, are authentic and show you exactly as it is and they don't create something so i, I just wanted to throw that out because i've seen both um so when people say reality television people are always oh you know oh, oh it's made up and the colonel knows as well we we spend a lot of time in the field or back in the control room discussing story and trying to keep it authentic and letting the network know that's what we want to air and that's what you're buying an authentic tv show so, so there's both sides okay so in that vein um and i you know the idea that there's roles for people to play on a reality show there's character roles and it seems that they always have a role for each person there's the angry person there's the withdrawn person there's the uh whatever the the typecast is that still seems to be pretty pervasive in that they want to mix it up. And I'm thinking in, in particular on, on competitive shows. That's, that's where you see it most often. Um, which, what are your thoughts on that? And because it, and I'll, let me just add another piece to that. The black people always get voted off first. <laughs> it is a microcosm of society, the way it's set up. And it's really turned me off from competitive shows nowadays because it's so obvious and the fact that people haven't taken that seriously and decided to mix it up and make it a little bit more <laughs> equitable has really turned me off. So I throw that at you and I just want to get your response to that. And I'd like to say that I would love to work with you further on that. I would love to get some examples and especially in this day and age, um, a lot of people are paying a lot more attention to everything. Um, um, but if there's a place where you feel that, you know, you're not seeing it or they do get voted off first, I just, I'd love to work with you on that and look at that deeper. Yeah, I, I have to tell you, nobody was a bigger reality fan than me. I, I was on the front end of it. I was the champion of it. And what it's turned out to be and how I've seen this play itself out, it's really a huge disappointment to me. So I'd love to talk further about it. Yeah. Carol, any thoughts on that? Well, you, cause you, I think you're specifically talking about like competition reality shows and I've, and so I think of like the ones that I've done, cause I watch some competition reality, but, but I'm thinking about the ones that I've produced mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, I've produced, I, I've produced, uh, uh, pussycat dolls, search for the next doll and, and, and yeah, girlicious. And there were, a, and I also produced Miss Rap Supreme. Um, mm -hmm. and there were it was a lot of, a lot of ethnicities on those shows. And, right. and it was, just, I think it was just a little different. I'm trying to think of, yeah. um, but, but I hear what you're saying, like on the shows that, um, that, 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 uh, you know, African-Americans are often kicked out first. I, 
it's something that I have that I would definitely want to look at and be like, okay, let's let's see this because obviously that's something that's that's a huge deal. Especially in this day and age when it, it's a conversation to be had. I think it's a time to look at how it's played out. So I appreciate both of your uh, perspectives on that. Um, one more question and Susie, I'm going to throw it to you. Um, the idea that becoming a producer was something that you kind of climbed the ladder to become. Was this your end game? Is this what you wanted for yourself? Are you where you wanted to be? This isn't my end game. No, I'm going to keep going. I mean, I, I, it, I've, it's, I'm, I, I did want to get to like next level, next level. I wanted to get to show running for sure. I still get, I get a buzz out of coming up with something, creating something. And then I get a buzz every time other people want to watch it. It still blows my mind. I'm like, people want to watch something that I did? Like, that's awesome. It's the greatest feeling. It's a, it's a rush. It's a high. Um, I want, but I've been here now. I've been executive producing and running shows. I want the next thing. That's just my personality. And yeah, yeah, I do want the next thing. Whether that be kind of getting to the point where I'm overseeing many shows at once mm -hmm. um, or something else. I just, I, I definitely do want to uh, keep creating and, and take it to the next level and challenge myself. I think that's the best way to do it. Wow. Colonel, I love what you just said. And I'm thinking, um, in my past life, I was Colonel's agent, and I've known you one way as someone that networks and buyers and production companies have come back to me and said, oh, he's so strong, what's he doing next? And now I'm working with both of you on this virtual age march, and I'm watching you put every crumb of creativity. And I was never aware of how much work goes into one idea, one project, how it really takes so much imagination and creativity that I think is so invisibilized by the end of the product, mm. right? So we watch TV and we have no idea, JD and I, how you and Julie do what you do, but yet there it is on the screen. What is that process, the creative process that you both take yourselves through in order to achieve the vision that gets interrupted or contaminated by other people? How do you stay true to the vision? On the network side, you know, we, we make sure that we're buying something that is organic and natural and maybe we'll get some eyeballs. If, if it's a competition show, or like I said, a docu-series. Um, and you just need to put together a strong team. Like Colonel, uh, you know, he's an amazing producing partner. And we wear different hats, you know? Um, and him and crossing him over into overseeing more projects, you know, fits you more into like the network side of things or the production company overseeing a lot. Um, and it's just more, you have to know how to produce. It's math, it's organization, it's contact, and it's relationship. Yeah, and it's most of all, it's, the, it's just knowing how to build that house, mm -hmm. the ins and outs. Earlier, Julie kind of, in a way, answered that question you just asked, Susie, because she was talking about how at the end, like when you, she brought it, like when you're dealing with the network, it seems all kind of like effortless in a way and seamless. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about. And I think that, that totally is the goal, like to make it look, uh, I, I often say like, we create a passive experience for people. Mm -hmm. I want people to sit back. We're you relax. We're taking you on a journey. This is passive. For you. We're going to do the work. So you get to sit in your chair. It's not a video game, you know, this is, you're not out playing sports. You get to have a passive experience and we are going to emotionally take you somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, and, and there's, ton, and that you're seeing, there's tons of work that goes into this. Mm -hmm. You'll thing. never, unless you do it, you'll never know. And when you yeah. start at the bottom, you see what it takes and it takes more than a village. It yeah. really does. Um, and, uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but when you get enough under your belt, you can remain kind of fluid and nimble 
you know, this project needs to look this, like when Colonel's out in the field, let's say producing or editing, on the network side, I'm going, how are we gonna schedule this? How many times can we repeat it? What if I wanna pick up a second season? So my wheels are constantly going and um, it's all, we all just want success, you know, and that's the team. You work towards the same goal. You just use the word sort of at the bottom, right? And, and I'm thinking back to what JD had said, how has your whiteness protected you in your climb to the top? Julie, do you mind if I start this one off? No, I'm, no. I'm going to verbalize that it's hard for me to even, and, and JD, you asked the, the other question earlier about right. black people being kicked off the shows earlier. And now, Susie, you're asking one. This is hard for me. It is hard. because, And I'm just going to voice that, and I'm going to answer yeah. it and fumble through this. But I'm going to tell you yeah. this, that it's hard. Because yeah. I have lived in this this whole time yeah. and it's actually only now it, it and and i've it, it's changed my, my whole perspective on whiteness and everything has changed over time and it, but it, it really is the the situation we're in now where it's it's right here yeah. and that's something that is that i'm personally in the process of going okay and you know with my kids and with the thing and going okay what stuff that just seemed like, yeah, this is just how life is. But hold on, it's not like this for everybody. And to have that kind of empathy and that kind of understanding, it, it, I'm in the process of doing that right now. And I think a lot of people, a lot of, I mean, the country's in this reckoning right now. It's happening right now. And I don't, it's, it's like how it obviously has been an asset not just whiteness but i'm a white man <laughs> you know it's yeah it, yeah it, it, there's been the advantages to that and the the you know just it, the un even the unseen things in the unseen ways or the uh, the stuff that isn't apparent to me that uh, how maybe i've come off and i have that has been that has been interpreted different ways by different people and and you know it's that that is something that absolutely right now is like i said the country's going through that reckoning i'm definitely going through it too and thinking about it and like ah this has definitely helped well thank you honestly so much for sharing that and what you're talking about is your privilege right mm -hmm. and it is white male privilege and I don't know if you know this, Colonel, but JD was my professor in grad school, and she taught a class called Multicultural Mental Health, and of all the classes I've ever taken in my life, that was the hardest one, because I didn't know about my privilege. It wasn't hard because we had to write papers, but we did. It was hard to come to terms with, oh wait, I've been seeing the world through this lens exclusively, and it hasn't given me, or I haven't taken it to the next level to understand my privilege and how to act upon it in positive ways. I've just taken it for granted. Mm -hmm. JD, do you have anything to say? I want to check in with you before we go to Julie. No, go ahead. Go ahead. That's what you're saying. I wanted to invite you in. Oh, uh, well, I, no, I, I thoroughly appreciate what you said, Colonel. I really do. I felt you on that. I feel your authenticity in realizing that it's time to see things through other lenses. So I, I just appreciate that response. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. Jules? Well, I'm trying to figure out where JD's question intersects with mm. my experience. And the example I wanted to give is being at a network, somebody comes in and pitches us a show. Mm -hmm. And we try to set the tone of the show. We talk about cast, we talk about talent, everything. But we, like at Lifetime, have been very, very mindful of 
who we're going to cast in the show. We hit every demo. Lifetime was constantly, and the other networks as well, constantly putting us through focus groups and educating us as far as how to be as colorful, so to speak, as possible. And to just always be mindful of it. And it happens from day one when we buy the show. It happens when we're casting the show and they bring in big foam cores, foam, you know, plastic uh, sheets for us to look at of cast. And we make sure that we, that we cover every base. Um, and it goes, it goes through standards and practices. When you're doing a competition show, all this, like I did Project Runway for years. Oh, okay. And if you look at that, I'm, I'm not sure that's a good example because yeah, I feel cool. like, you know, I know we did very diverse, right. but the conversation should always continue. And in my experience, the network and the chiefs at the network have always given us, their, their employees, the opportunities to learn more. And, yeah. you know, that I'm really grateful for. And we take that out. I appreciate that. I do. I don't think it happens all the time. And it's evident in how, what the end product is. But it's, it's really refreshing to hear that it does happen somewhere. And, it, and you know, and it's, it's in the thought process. I appreciate hearing that. Well, I also, because I've worked with you, Julie, in the past, and I've known you for so long, I also know that you stand up for those, um, you stand up to inclusion and equality because that's who you are. And I'm wondering, holding that and holding LGBT, being a gay woman and being a woman, how that has affected you and your identity as you've risen through the ranks, starting out, you know, 30 years ago when the world was a different place, how it's affected you. I might be a rare example of somebody who maybe moved through it with some difficulty early on in my career, but it stopped. And I, as I started getting accolades or getting the network jobs where they really appreciated my hard work, um, it was easy to be who I am, to walk into big executive meetings, who I am. And, you know, I'd be lying if I, you know, I wasn't perfect the whole time. And, you know, when you're working for so many years to get up the ladder, you know, you sacrifice something. And some things fall to the wayside. And so when you asked earlier, or maybe J.D., what's next for you? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and for me, it's to still do the work I'm doing. But I would like to, I, I'm, my, I've been finding more balance. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I'm finding I'm so much more productive, efficient, and aware and awake. And so now I'm encouraging people, you know, start at the bottom and take every job. Yeah. But don't ever forget who you are and take that time out and check in with yourself. Mm -hmm. And yeah. be kind to everybody, no matter what they look like, who they love. I mean, seriously. Well, you're talking about authenticity. And, and the one thing that many things shine through about you, but always being so truthful and authentic, authentically Julie Stern, is kind of miraculous when I think about, I worked with Julie at Disney 30 years ago and it was just a different world. And everyone was hiding something. It just wasn't a safe place. And that journey is incredible and hearing what you just said just being truthful and authentic that's who i am and i tell other people to do that and i stand up for justice so thank you for being so incredible and inspiring and now i'm going to give you guys an easier question oh boy colonel here it comes okay so i'm sure everyone out there wants to be you both of you how do they do it? What do you tell them? I want to be Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to be Julie. <laughs> we have the Colonel and the General. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> but how how do people out there who want to be you, who want to get into television or film or meet this kind of life? What do they do? What is your advice to them? And I know both of you are big mentors. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what I tell uh, everybody I mentor, including my son who wants to do it. I, I, uh, first and foremost, whatever you want to do, do it. If you want to be a director, do direct. If you want to be an actor, act. Get Do the thing you want to be. And that comes first. Because when the opportunity, because the opportunities, they don't, they don't always come, but they do come. And when they come, if you know how to do the thing you want to do, or you have a passion for it, and like, I'll tell you, when I see some of the people that I'm working with that are young, and then they come in, and I see their, their gung ho about it and whatnot, I, I've absolutely hired people. I'll, bring, I'll hire them for their first gig. Because I'm like, that person wants to do this and loves it and has a passion for it. Let's go. And there, and, and it, it just do start off by just doing the thing you want to do, whatever that thing is. So it sounds like you really respect the hunger, like really, yeah. really how badly they want it and showing their passion and, mm -hmm. and working hard to get it. Jules. You know, for years, people have asked me that. They're like, how do I get started? What do I do? How'd you do it? And I said the same thing Colonel did. Just get started. Any opportunity that comes your way, go for it. And it may not be right on the money. You know, I wanted to be a director. My dad said, learn how to use a calculator and a typewriter or a keyboard and you'll always have a job. So my first production job was as an assistant production accountant at a wow. production company. And I was stapling checks to the check copies just so I could see what they were paying for things. So during wow. the week, I was learning on my own. And on the weekends, I volunteered on set. I pulled cable. I got coffee. And I, I moved into coordinating, then managing. And that's how I did it. And I, I agree with Colonel. That's what I would tell people to do. But sometimes you run up against somebody who just feels like they should walk right in and the pot of gold is right there. <laughs> but I still believe in hard work. Yeah. And it yeah. takes, but it works both ways. They need to work hard. And it's up to people like the four of us to mentor people and be awake and recognize they're working hard. They may not be the best, but maybe they are, the, you know, and, and they're working so hard and they want it so bad. Give them a chance. That's how I got here. Yeah. It feels like it has, to, it has something to do with being in the right place, though, as well. I mean, I, I didn't have the self-esteem to really know that I, to even ask the question, how do I? You know, I was just trying to figure out my way out of the web. And so it's, it's, it, has, it has to have something to do with being in the right place, showing up in the right place to ask that question. And, and if you're lucky enough, then you have somebody like either of you who can just give that boost of confidence and direction. I mean, that's a huge gift you offer. Yeah. Colonel, I asked Julie a question about identity. You just mentioned that you have a son who wants to be in it. Does he want to be an actor or a stand-up? He does. He does do stand-up. He does. Uh, he before you know before the quarantine, he was doing oh, under eighteen open mic. He's been doing it since he was fifteen. He'd go to the open mic nights and get up there with a bunch of drunken, drugged-out comedians uh, <laughs> that would just be. Uh, and really get up there and, and, and hold his own. He did well, you know, he's doing well. Um, so yeah, he wants to do that, but he also wants to produce and he, well, he wants to produce and direct his stuff and write and do the whole thing. You know, he's got it. He wants to do all that stuff. Well, Absolutely. I'm wondering for you, you made this successful transition from being a, in front of the camera to behind the camera. Is there, what what is hard about that and what do you perceive that maybe your son will have difficulty with um i mean my son and i are very different in that i, I think there's a and, and i think this, this is actually with producing well uh, as well julie and, and julie's a, a, a kind of a, a a master of this 
I would have to say is that there's a thing where you have to have this supreme confidence. You have to almost, you, you, because so much comes at you all the time, both in acting, like you have to have this, you have to have this boldness and in producing as well, you have to have a boldness and a confidence and yet um, not having, not have the, the, the difference between the producing, I think, and the acting is that the ego has to, you have to keep your ego in check with the producing. And um, this is something like I was saying, Julie's amazing at like the, the being able to like not have an inflated ego. Um, and I think, so my, my son, and, and, and you have to like really be able to kind of still be able to empathize, like we were saying, be kind to people and kind of keep that kind of level headedness. I think that with my son, he's very different in that he's, he's not as kind of like, um, I don't know, aggressively bold as I <laughs> have been. And then like, I can do anything, you know, and, and come out there, and, you know. Ah, take this hill. <laughs> um, he'll he'll go up there and do it, but he's got, he is more humble. So I actually think he would transition better than I did because when you're on the other side of the camera, it's really about you're you're really my like the goal has to be make everyone else look great. Uh-huh. Like I always that's that's how I keep my ego in check. I'm like my job is to make everyone else feel and look great at the end of this. I I that's it. I'm here to service to serve others. Where kind of like on the in the camera, I need to look. If I'm the one acting, I, if everything relies on me to look. To, you know, to 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 run, to um, be in the spotlight. Yeah, JD, it's so funny because I was thinking about our our show last week where we had the cops mm -hmm. and the women behind the badge, and they were saying that they see themselves as servants, like to make the world the public safe and it's just i i hadn't thought about uh, the way you've described your job is so i hadn't thought about it like that mm -hmm. and i really appreciate like who you are as a person and who you are as a producer and how it's so integrated yeah JD has some questions next. Well, actually, oh, actually I, think we should, I think we should do the game. I think we should do the game before we run out of time. Okay. Let's do that. And then I don't know. Like, you ready? I don't know what the game is. Okay. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, I, but, you know, I've been stretching, so I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I think we should throw the game in here to lighten it up. Or maybe not lighten it up. Go ahead, Susie. Word association with Susie and JD. So we're gonna throw out a word and you're gonna come back at us with a word. So I'll start with, we'll start with- No, 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 I got it, Susie, I got it. Do it and they have to say it at the same time. Oh. I'll be the okay. ears. You, you take the game, JD, you go. No, go, 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 you have the words. By the way, Julie and I have a game for the two of you after this. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay great. Racism. Real. And. Good. Privilege. Me. Life. Fear. Trust. Bravery. Bravery, trust. Nice. Failure. Success. <laughs> it's that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Change. Always. Part of life. Memory. Conflicting. It's awesome. Wow, you guys. That was great. That was great. Who's scoring? No score. <laughs> no score. No uh, score. Okay, okay. Do you have our list, Colonel? <laughs> <laughs> we all won. We all won with your responses. <laughs> now, you guys, for people who want to reach you, who want to see you, where can they find you? Well, for me, I'm just redoing my website, so um, that'll be announced shortly. Great. Perfect. Colonel. I mean, I Facebook, you can find me on Facebook, uh, or, 
or Instagram. Although I'm not as active on Instagram. I do post some pictures. <laughs> So I have I have one final question for you, but first I want to thank you both immensely. Yeah. It's really educational and you were authentic and totally appreciate it and value everything that you said. So thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I want to wrap it up with, if you could do one thing to change the world, what would it be? Stay involved. Hmm. If I could do one thing, I would open the lines of communication with everyone. Excellent. Nice, both of you, wow. Susie, you have anything you wanna add before we say goodbye? No, I'm super inspired and I'm really grateful for being able to sit here and really appreciate who you both are and what you both do and what you both contribute because it's kind of selfless. And not many people realize what they just see the fanciness and the red carpets and producer and now you humanized it so thank you don't miss your opportunity to humanize something yeah there you go and then there's that excellent yeah that okay. part thank you so much okay you got it thank you thank you everybody before thank before i go me. away can i ask jd a quick question sure can. What, what what competition shows do you like well, I used to watch uh, Big Brother. I used to watch Survivor, um, MTV. I used to watch, God, there were, I watched them all. So I, I did two all. seasons of Big Brother. You did? Uh, I loved that show too, because that, as Julie was saying, like the real shows, that's, that's the most authentic one because they don't, I mean, it's completely hands off. It is, that's it is, except for the casting. That's one of the ones that's guilty of the casting. Yeah, yeah. I will connect you with the casting director. <laughs> you know Very what? Very good friend of mine. They shoot it right down the street from me at CBS. I would love to connect the two of you. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to have a conversation because I think they want the show to last long and, and people are starting to get a hint that it, the setup isn't really conducive to have an equitable experience. And that's unfortunate, you know? It's like, because you have, to, you have to look at it in terms of who the majority is, and then you have to balance the numbers. So if, if the white dominant culture is the majority, then you have to have more people of color so that that really balances the playing field. And you see race play out in every one of those shows, every one of those shows. I could sit and watch it with you and I could point out each and every time that it occurs and how it's become problematic because it reinforces you know, the overall message that no matter how hard we play or what we do, we're gonna be outnumbered. It's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, you know, my, my, my experience has been tainted, unfortunately. So it was really cool to talk about that with you both. I'd love to can you continue this conversation with you, Jade, uh, JD. I really would, and yeah, Susie, sure. I really would. I appreciate that. Of course. <laughs>